you some enemies that suggest that you would take down. <laughs> In the first series of The Lobby, Al Jazeera's investigative unit exposed the role of pro-Israel operatives in Britain. The headline's at 11 o'clock. Israel's ambassador to the UK has apologised after a senior diplomat was caught on camera saying he wanted to take down the Foreign Office Minister, Sir Alan Duncan. Sir Alan Duncan, who's a strong critic of Jewish settlements. An undercover reporter for Al Jazeera doing an investigation into Britain's relationship with Israel. This investigation exposes a covert Israeli campaign to influence British policy. The investigation led to the resignation of Shai Massot, a senior political officer at the Israeli embassy. Mr. Massot is also heard describing the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson as an idiot. The diplomat in question uh, no longer seems to be a functionary of the embassy in London. Uh, and so whatever, whatever he may exactly have been doing here, his cover can uh, be said to have been well and truly blown. At the same time, Al Jazeera had been running a second undercover operation. Some of our reporters' covert filming was included in the first series of The Lobby. His identity became known. Tony had spent five months inside the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. He'd impressed colleagues with his understanding of the Middle East. You have the resourcefulness and the depth you know, to sort of think strategically about this, whereas most people aren't able to do that. A prominent Jewish online magazine described Tony as the perfect gentleman who became one of the town's best-liked Zionist activists. You did amazing work here. The guys don't stop talking about you. They still talk about you. Tony threw elaborate parties. And apparently anyone interested in telling a story about sinister Israeli influence in America's capital couldn't have asked for a better guest list. In the new edition of The Lobby, we investigate the role of pro-Israel advocacy groups in this country in the first of a four-part series, how The Lobby is being drawn into Israel's covert campaign to spy on American citizens. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Getting $38 billion in security aid to Israel matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. The only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. Seems to be achieving its goals threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. So that means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. So all the Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. uh, in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory. Not for everybody. We are a different government working on foreign soil and we have to be very, very cautious. We have three different sub-campaigns which are very, very sensitive. 
regarding data gathering, information analysis, working on activist organization, money trail. This is something that only a country with its resources can do the best. If you want to win, we have to change our ways. We have to think differently. And this is waging a holistic campaign against the other side. Take him out of his comfort zone. Make him be on the defensive. Israel is involved in a secretive influence campaign whose aim is to discredit its challenges in the West. In the Air Force, when you want to win, you have to have aerial superiority. If you want to win a campaign, you must have information superiority. And this is exactly the added value Israel capabilities, technological and otherwise, we can bring to the game, and we are working on that very hard. In the United States, the lobby is working with Israel to spy on American citizens. We're giving them uh, data, for example, one day Sima's deputy is sending me a photo, just a photo in WhatsApp, so you can boycott Israel on a billboard. hours our systems and analysts could find the exact organization, people, and even their names where they live. We gave it back to the ministry, I have no idea what they did with this, but in fact three days later there were no billboards. We use all sorts of technology. We use corporate level enterprise grade social media intelligence software. Almost all of this happens on social media, so we have custom algorithms and formulae that acquire the stuff immediately. In terms of like information sharing, we, we did add the Ministry of Strategic Affairs to our operations and, and intelligence brief, which kind of goes back to how do we get information about what's going on American college campuses. Generally, within about 30 seconds or less of one of these things popping up on campus, whether it's a Facebook event, whether it's the right kind of mention on Twitter, the system picks it up, it goes into a queue and alerts our researchers, and they evaluate it, they tag it, and if it rises to a certain level, we issue early warning alerts to our partners. They operate through subterfuge, and they walk a very thin line between the legal and illegal in what they do in order to gather information and to smear their opponents and just ultimately destroy them. In order to understand how the pro-Israel lobby operates, you have to literally be a fly on the wall. If you can't obtain information publicly, you should try to get into the room through other means. Our undercover reporter, Tony, is British and Jewish and had recently graduated from the University of Oxford. He wrote articles and presented himself as a strong supporter of Israel. In Washington, he attended a course on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'm from the UK, and I, I'm just taking a course at Georgetown here over the summer. He networked in the social circles of the pro-Israel lobby. Hi, I'm Rona. I'm Tony. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. I'm good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey. After building his profile, Tony was accepted on a training course in pro-Israel advocacy. Welcome to Fuel for Truth DC's second boot camp. Congratulations, everyone, to being accepted. What we're going to do right now is uh, just kind of like introduce ourselves. I'm Daniel. After undergrad, I served in the IDF and the paratroopers for two years and worked in APAC for a year. One session criticized the UN agency that provides aid for Palestinians. Children are taught in UNRWA Palestinian schools to hate Jews. Another lecture dealt with the international media. Because about the media bias. During the last war, a lot of times videos are circulating uh, of, you know, of bombed areas or victims. And a lot of it's from Syria, from Iraq 10 years ago, all this stuff. In role play workshops, they were instructed how to respond to criticism of Israel. Can I have a volunteer? The apartheid wall is cutting off Palestine. Boycott Israel. Divest from Israel. Sanction uh, companies that do business with Israel. 
it's kind of oddly colored wall, given that like 90% of it is events. This is a photo, I see a wall. Why can Israel do more to help Tony? Our undercover reporter played the role of pro-Israel advocate. Israel is doing a lot to help the Palestinians. I say actually Israel is doing all the best that they can, but you know, it's a tough situation. The people, businesses in Gaza can't, can't freely send their trucks into Israel to sell their goods. I, I think you'll find that that's actually a misconception. They do allow their trucks, and what they don't allow is, is dangerous material. Okay, stop! After the course, Tony was accepted as a volunteer at a pro-Israel communications group called the Israel Project. It's a Tony Kleinfeld. Uh, Kleinfeld. Kleinfeld. Like Seinfeld, but with a K. <laughs> the Israel Project, known as TIP, describes itself on its promotional videos as a strategic communications group. At TIP, we believe we've found the answer. Israel's enemies have left the battlefield of the Middle East and are now fighting on the battlefield of public opinion. What you have with regard to the United States and Israel is a special relationship that is unprecedented in recorded history. Not simply that the United States gives Israel a tremendous amount of economic aid and diplomatic protection. It gives that aid and protection uh, no matter what, right? It's not conditional. And the Israel Project will go to enormous lanes to achieve that end. During his placement as a volunteer, Tony took notes on what he saw and heard in Tip's offices. He worked in what they called the war room, where media and communications are monitored. Staff described having contacts at numerous media organizations. Their primary means of influence is by forging friendships with reporters. One employee claimed that during talks on the nuclear deal with Iran, Tip applied pressure on the Associated Press news agency to change a headline. Tony read the Israel Project's annual report, which described Tip's mission as building an echo chamber for pro-Israel information. That means using the media to amplify and repeat Tip's messages as well as what the report describes as neutralizing undesired narratives. Tony saw one document which claimed that the echo chamber was within their grasp. Weeks before he started, Tony discussed with a senior manager how Tip deals with the media. You can get a lot more done by making questions get asked by journalists. And if you create it from multiple directions at the same time through multiple journalists, then you need to create a kind of sense of crisis. We develop relationships a lot about them, a lot of them, to get them to trust us. The uh, basic message is on the following. BDS is essentially a kind of a hate group targeting Israel. They're anti-peace. We try not to even use the term just because it, it builds their brand. We just refer to boycotters. The goal is to actually make things happen now and to figure out what are the means of communication to do that. In 2005, Palestinian civil rights groups sought a peaceful means to protest against Israel's occupation. They identified goods from Israel and called for their boycott. The BDS movement was born. BDS adopted a nonviolent strategy because we think it is morally consistent and very effective against an enemy that is extremely powerful militarily. We called for boycotting Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it, as was done against apartheid South Africa to achieve basic Palestinian rights under international law. Over the past decade, BDS has grown around the world. By campaigning for Palestinian civil rights in land controlled by Israel, 
BDS believes it has exposed a deficiency in the moral defense of the Jewish state. BDS is saying that what Israel has to do is treat the Palestinians in its midst the same way it treats Israeli Jews. The problem is that if Israel does that, there are more Palestinians, or there will be more Palestinians inside greater Israel than there are Jews. And that means that if you had a system where everybody was treated equally and there was one person and one vote, that you would no longer have a Jewish state. The secretive Ministry of Strategic Affairs, based in the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem, was given a mission, establish a covert campaign to defeat the BDS movement. Government ministers attacked me in person, one of them threatening BDS leaders with targeted civil assassination, and others threatening to revoke my permanent residency, along other threats. לא מעטים מבין מנהיגי ה-BDS מקיימים קשרים, קשרים כספיים, קשרים ארגוניים, קשרים אחרים, עם גורמים עוינים למדינת ישראל. תפקידנו, באמצעות הפעלת המודיעין, לחשוף את הקשרים האלה, ובהחלט באמצעות החשיפה הזאת, גם לדעת לפעול נגדם, לבודד אותם, גם להעביר מידע לאותם גורמים מודיעיניים בעולם וגורמים אחרים. ישראל חייבת לבצע סיכול אזרחי ממוקד במנהיגות למול פעילי ה-BDS. The campaign includes monitoring the activities of American students. אנחנו עכשיו למשל נמצאים בתהליך שלם של ליצור תמונה כוללת על הקמפוסים. אם אתה רוצה לנצח תופעה, אתה צריך לדעת להיות עליה בעליונות במידע וידע. Our investigation into the role of the Israeli state at U.S. campuses led Tony to an employee at the embassy in Washington. She's American, and her job is to analyze BDS activity for the Israeli government. So, like, nobody really knows what we're doing. Um, but mainly it's been a lot of, like, research, like, monitoring BDS things and reporting it back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, like, making sure everyone knows what's going on. They need a lot of research done and stuff like that. When they talk about it in Knesset, like, usually I've, like, contributed to what the background information is. I'm not going to campuses. It's more about connecting organizations and, I guess, campuses and providing, like, resources and strategy if students need it. Is the Israeli embassy trying to leverage faculty? Or? Yeah. Um, we're working with several faculty like advocacy groups that kind of train faculty, so we're like helping them a little bit with like funding, connections, bringing them to speak, having them speak to diplomats and people in the MFA that need this information. So I kind of want to be that resource to show students like we appreciate you and see what we're, you're doing. Here's some information if you need anything at all. We can connect to you, just kind of be that person there for you. Julia was president of the pro-Israel group at Davis, which is part of the University of California. Davis began as a center for agricultural studies, and its students are known as Aggies. I came to UC Davis, which had a reputation of being like a really pro-Israel, now it's like the top five most anti-Israel schools in the US. Why is that? Because of everything that happened in the last few years. It was just particularly bad. Um, and there's a huge Muslim population in Sacramento, which is right next to Davis. The growing support for the BDS movement in Davis and the lobby's response to it is part of a narrative that's unfolding across America's campuses. Students for Justice in Palestine, or SJP, brought a divestment motion before the Student Senate. 
I was very, very nervous. The entire room was filled. I think we had about 600 students and people from the community coming in to witness this vote. I am here today because quite frankly, I am ashamed. I am ashamed of my university for supporting apartheid as of my people in Palestine. I ended the speech with something along the lines of being on the right side of history and for the university to end its unethical ties with these corporations who were doing uh, brutal things uh, to Palestinians. We knew they were going to win because our entire student senate was all pro BDS and like they ran for that purpose and won for that purpose and we've been pushed out of student government for months. Good evening. My name is Julia Rivkin, and I'm the president of Aggies for Israel. Students streamed the hearing online. The pro-Israel group also filmed it with another purpose in mind. Their videos would play a key part in the story that was to unfold in the days ahead. I was waiting to see what she would say. I was waiting for a blow to come my way, and that blow sure came. We have been ignored and disrespected year after year, but we have never been silenced. We are a beacon of peace and inclusion on a campus plagued by anti-Semitism. The talking points were that the resolution was anti-Semitic, um, that it was divisive. If it's divisive in the fact that you either support human rights or you don't, then so be it. The intolerance that spawned this resolution is the same kind of intolerance that has spawned anti-Semitic movements throughout history. The entire thing looked very rehearsed. Very, very aggressive, almost comically so. Julia and her pro-Israel allies had already decided that they didn't want to debate. At 4 a.m. the night before, me and my team were like, you're going to leave the walkout. And I was like, OK. Um, and they're like, we're going to film it just for our own purposes. And I was like, totally cool. So when everything was happening, like we went into it knowing we were going to lose. So our strategy was how to like ultimately win while losing the vote. This is our victory. And we who are victorious need not legitimize the words spoken in this empty hearing. So if you are here tonight in opposition to this resolution, I invite you now to stand up, really stand up, and join me in walking out of the room. That was a wowing moment. To have them just stand up, everyone just kind of was like, what, what's going on? It was very shocking. As they were leaving, it was just a very big rush of relief to not have that tension, those bad vibes in the room. Um, and so we started cheering, actually, and it was a great moment. If you're standing in the back, it looks like some seats have opened up. <laughs> but the passing of the BDS motion proved to be just the beginning of a bigger story. In part two, how the lobby worked to undermine the student decision. Those false stickers, who did them? We don't even know. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Our undercover reporter was meeting an employee of the Israeli embassy in Washington. She had led a pro-Israel group while at university in California. So if you are here tonight in opposition to this resolution... Students at Davis were about to vote in favor of a divestment motion. During the debate, the pro-Israel group staged a walkout. They uploaded videos to publicize their protest. Our thought was to control the narratives by having the speech like we wanted it to cause attention. We wanted everyone to see us walking out to show that like this doesn't represent us or shit about this. Um, so that's how we kind of formulated it. That day, all of us released like 50 op-eds and major news sources so that when people made a hashtag and like a whole thing trending, so when people opened their Facebooks, it wouldn't be them celebrating their victory, it'd be us sharing our stories. Once it blew up, then random people, like the Huffington Post contacted me and was like, do you have anything to say? And I was like, immediately, I wrote an op-ed two weeks ago just in case. weren't involved in anything, like their entire news feed was Israel stuff, and like that was what we wanted, because that's how we got the word out there. How do you delegitimize the other side? Delegitimizing them, 
um, kind of through that, that lens of taking over and like making them sound crazy at their game. A student senator who's Muslim made a Facebook status saying like Israel will fall, like Sharia law is taking over Davis, like we want Hamas, like that kind of status. So that happened. We had been called terrorists and told that we were Hamas sympathizers, that we want to bring Sharia law to campus and things like that. Hi, everyone. My name is Azka Azka Fayaz. I'm a second year political science major. Azka Fayaz was a committed BDS activist and claims that pro Israel students repeatedly tried to link her to political violence. They just came up to me and said, You're a terrorist. Are you a terrorist? You're going to bring, you know, terrorism <laughs> to the student government. Um, and things of that nature. And vote smart. I know her. It was ironic. She was directly making a joke of that. When I saw it, though, given the climate at the time, I did grow concern. People who were involved, you know, they were like, hey, there's actually uh, a lot of negative postings on social media. They're sharing your picture and the cover photo with your caption. It's turning really ugly. That caption was reposted and retweeted over and over and over again. I knew that something big was sort of going to happen. Pro-Israel students were taunted by pro-Hamas students after an anti-Israel vote passed on campus. Listen and watch. Right after the vote passed, a student senator posted this on Facebook. Hamas and Sharia law have taken over UC Davis BRB crying over the resilience. I don't have the capacity to bring Sharia law to the University of California Davis. Um, I don't think any, <laughs> any of us really do have the capacity. They wanted to try to make me look as evil and violent as possible. How can we use their words out of context in such a way that their victory doesn't seem so victorious anymore? Conveniently, like, the divestment video just happened to do that. Like, when they all started shouting, all the walk far as we were leaving, like, that was really nice for us in a way, because, like, we caught them um, just, you know, yeah. doing what they're doing. And then it, like, went viral on YouTube. Anger and tension running high at the University of California Davis campus. What you just saw played out late last week as the Student Government Association voted on a resolution to boycott the Jewish state of Israel. They kept showing it over and over again. And then they just said that the Muslim students forced the pro-Israel students to leave the room. Reports say when the Israel, Israel supporters tried to object to this vote, the pro-Palestinian students you just saw tried to shout them down with cries of Alu Akbar. I invite you now to stand up, really stand up, and join me in walking out of the room. Of course, we know that they left willingly and they stated that they were going to walk out of the room. It's incredible to sit to hear Alu Akbar uh, yeah. shouted well, that, in the middle of this university, and what is that? And what does that represent, Megan? The subjugation of women, the torture of uh, homosexuals, uh, the, the torture of Christians, the crucifixion of Christians. That's what it has come to represent, and that's what they're shouting. The pro-BDS activists at UC Davis then faced another crisis. Two days after a resolution passed, unfortunately, someone defamed the Jewish frat house and um, had painted swastikas all over it. Outrageous, uh, just not acceptable behavior at all. What was upsetting to us, however, was they had the media there right away. Disturbing discovery for a UC Davis student. Uh, Jewish students found swastikas painted on their fraternity house in Davis. These swastikas were discovered that morning and around 10 a.m., my best guess, and I believe the news media were there by 11. Pro-Israel students say they feared recent events would lead to this. This week has been sort of a bad week to be Jewish on campus. After years of heated meetings, a student body passed a resolution Thursday urging UC Davis to end any affiliation with companies that support Israel. So this is not out of the blue. We're pretty sure this is directly related. Who were they finger pointing at? but us. 
us who were still on this high of finally getting this resolution passed still in high spirits just crushed us. Roseanne Barr tweeted, all the Jews should leave Davis and the rest of the school should be nuked. It was a crazy time. A general flooding of Islamophobia by the media. And I was dealing with like news outlets and media and it was like the day after there was some swastikas on campus and it was like, it all blew up and who, what, yeah, a full time job. Those swastikas, like who, who did them? We don't even know. I think it's just some like random, like white supremacist type people who just came, did it, left. We don't think it was students. That's pretty surprising because it was very clear from their behavior towards us and their attitudes towards us that we had done some heinous crime to them and that we deserved to pay for it. Students who were part of the divestment movement painted swastikas on the fraternity. That's what she was hinting at. That's what she was trying to imply. Why would we act against our interest and, and do that at a moment when we were, I guess, victorious? The fact that it was just so quickly tossed onto us as those who had done this, it was damaging. It was hugely damaging. That was kind of our strategy. A lot of it was media-based, which is like kind of my interest in media. And I would say that's like 99% of what it means to be successful. That happened. Then there was another swast. It was just like every day something new was happening and had to... It was weird because they won. Yeah. So you think if they would win, why would they do exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. So, well, that was kind of our whole strategy is we knew they were going to win. Were you in touch with the embassy or were you in touch with like any uh, groups? Pretty much or? all of the groups. Um, not the embassy, I guess our consulate. As well as the Israeli consulate in San Francisco, Julia's anti-BDS campaign had the guidance of several pro-Israel lobby groups. Stand With Us helped us a little bit in terms of actual research on the speech. They gave us some like legal research type stuff. Um, I'm always biased and want to work with APAC, so they kind of helped for like more support. Um, and David Project helped us a little bit. It was more help like gaining contact in like the media world. I guess we needed money to pay for somebody to film the speech. Like we had a Davis faculty for Israel group and like they were hugely helpful to us. They would, you know, because some of them were retired lawyers so they'd write legal documents for us. They knew the administration, they were tenured, they had pull. Despite the passing of the BDS motion, the governors of the university known as regents are under no obligation to abide by the students' vote. As for that resolution to boycott Israel, well, UC Regents issued a statement saying they will not even entertain the idea. After looking back on everything, I feel a little creepy because of what happened after the vote. People that were affiliated with the group just were smeared and had to deal with this, these very personal crises of the world calling us terrorists and the world thinking that we were this spiteful hate group. It's pretty unequivocal how organized they were, how brutal and uh, ruthless that narrative was and how it affected us in the end. Back in Washington, our undercover reporter was attending the annual conference of the Israeli American Council. The IAC's role is to connect American Jews to Israel. This year, combating BDS was top of the agenda. I think we need to worry. The polling isn't good. And all of you probably know it. If you look at the polls, the younger you get on the demographic scales, the lower support for Israel is. It seems to be achieving its goals, and I think it, it threatens future American support for Israel. Younger people are leaving college less sympathetic to Israel than when they enter. The lobby hoped that a new partnership with Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs will become a game changer in the fight against BDS. For years, we are trying to defeat the BDS and the Danish Convention Movement. 
We are all on the defensive. And I think we should move to the offensive. Using especially cyber and internet tools to try and defeat this ugly movement. I'm really honored to present my partners here. Brigadier General Sima Vatengil, the Director General of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Sima, please. The fact that the Israeli government decided to be a key player means a lot, because we can bring things that usually are not existing in NGOs or civilian entities that are now enrolled in this thing. The Israeli government can look at the bigger picture and actually create this coordination and cooperation. We are the only player inside the pro-Israeli network who can actually say that he's filling the gaps. The Israeli official described to members of the lobby the first phase of the covert war. Ambiguity is part of our guidelines. That's why I'm not going to say anything too much about each one of the legs. The first okay. one is intel, intelligence, or data, or information. What we've done is mapped and analyzed the whole phenomena globally, not just the United States. Not just campuses, but campuses and intersectionality and labor unions and, and churches. We started to establish a project called Israel Cyber Shield. This project is actually a civil intelligence unit that collects, analyzes, and acts upon the activists in the BDS movement, if it's people, organizations, or events and we give everything we collect. We are using the most sophisticated uh, data system, intelligence system in the Israeli market. Let's take the defense activity that we're doing and make it into proactivity and offense activity. Israel has used cyber sabotage. We suffered from intense denial of service attacks, hacking attacks on our websites. Israel decided to go on cyber warfare against BDS publicly. They said, we shall spy on BDS individuals and networks, especially in the West. We have not heard a peep from any Western government complaining that Israel is admitting that it will spy on your citizens. Imagine Iran saying it will spy on, on British or American citizens. Just imagine what could happen. The Ministry of Strategic Affairs brings together this group called the Global Coalition for Israel. And it's like leading pro-Israel advocacy groups um, around the world. My view and the view of Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which we coordinate with sometimes, we, we communicate with sometimes, is um, like Europe is lost and it's basically over. And like they're turning a lot of attention now to the US because they feel we're on your path. Can I join these? I'd love to. I don't know if you'd love me. But... It's like a pretty sensitive conversation, yeah. but it's going well. If China was doing this, if Iran was doing it, if Russia was doing it, there would be uproar. You would have Congress going after them, you would have hearings, you would have prosecutions. The question is, how does Israel get away with this? It's modeled on General Stanley McChrystal's counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq. We've copied a lot from that strategy that has been working really well for us, actually. And one of the pieces is this operations and intelligence brief. We're using social media intelligence, a tool called Iranian 6. We're phasing that out over the next year, and we're bringing on more sophisticated technology that was developed in Israel. An American should not be spied on by a foreign government that is able to access all this information and possibly undermine their ability to exercise their democratic rights in this country. So we're not dealing with amateurs. This is not an amateur work. We're dealing with a government that have a ministry at a ministerial level engaged in the systematic targeting of activists outside of its sovereign borders. The only way it's going to stop is if 
you know, somebody in the government uh, points out this is illegal and we're not going to tolerate it. And if we do tolerate it, other countries are going to do it as well. There's a company called Census, S-E-N-S-U-S. -S -S. It's like very pricey though, you know. We had to raise like hundreds of thousand dollars yeah. just for it. It's gonna increase our discovery rate. We're discovering just about everything we need. It's also going to bring new sources online that we weren't able to access in an automated fashion, like message boards. And um, we have ways to crawl message boards right now and to monitor them, but it's like disconnected from the event and activity discovery mechanism so that we want that system to be all integrated. So mm -hmm. they're, we just signed the contract yesterday for um, them to start that work. They actually already started it. Good friends in Israel that are helping us with that. You would think that since the United States has this special relationship with Israel and gives it so much largesse and protects it diplomatically at every turn and gives this assistance unconditionally, uh, that the Israelis would do less spying here than other countries do. But on the contrary, what we see is that the Israelis are, are probably at the top of the list when it comes to foreign countries spying inside the United States. Our investigation into Israel's covert war against BDS led Tony back to Julia Rifkind. She's American, and her full-time job at the Israeli embassy is monitoring BDS. She summed up a typical day at the office. Wow, it just looks like the state of Israel is employing little spies and you can't take a breath without Israel hearing about it. Julia spoke about her former days as a student. While at UC Davis, she was also an activist with APAC. The training she received from the most powerful arm of the pro-Israel lobby left its mark. I can immediately tell a meeting with somebody where they're trying to make me. I go away that I talk about stuff like, how does MK Patrick and Kansas yeah. activists, the way they call it? Yeah. I can tell when somebody's on the stand with us, or David Frederick, or ICC, or Hasbro, or Kandra, or ZOA. Like, I can kind of tell. She's been trained really well. She follows the commands that she has been given by these Israeli organizations, and she follows it really well. I pretty much all my friends work at APAC, all of them. So whenever we have events at the embassy, and there's like, oh, we should invite APAC people. It's like a joke that, like, obviously, I'm going to be the one to, like, write all the emails down. So whatever, they're like, we have to submit names and, like, lists for events. Mine's, like, 15 names, and, like, 14 of them are APAC. APAC encourages the students it trains to conceal any affiliation. When you're lobbying on behalf of APAC, you don't say APAC. You say I'm a pro-Israel student from the campus. And when you're meeting with students on campus, I would never say, like, I am the APAC campus rep. I say, my name's Julian, I'm a pro-Israel student. Like, you don't need the title, you don't need the organization. APAC's involvement in student council elections is also kept secret. APAC attracts the more political students, students who are more interested in like lobbying. We have like campaigns and stuff like that. We deal with student elections, very behind the scenes. They actually were found to have put cameras in the rooms where there were meetings going on. I liked meeting outside where there are no rooms and there are no possible cameras under the chairs or wherever they may have put them. I have several weird Facebooks. I have my fake Facebook that I follow, like, all the SJP accounts. Mm -hmm. I have, like, some fake names. My name is Jay Bernard or something. So it just sounds like an old white guy, which is the plan. Um, I tried to, I, like, joined all these groups. A lot of people have an added name. I mean, I maybe just wanted to see on the news feed like what kind of articles they were sharing, just to kind of see like, what their internal dialogue was. Every single event that I put on, you would have these pro-Israel groups coming out before our guests even got there with their cameras videotaping. Julia has no contact with her handlers in Israel. She writes her intelligence briefs and awaits their instructions. I write a 
report like it to my boss who translates it. It's really weird. We don't like talk to them on the phone or like email or whatever. There's like a special like server that's like really secure that I don't have access to because I'm an American. You have to have like tenants to have access to the server. It's called cables. It's not even necessarily in Hebrew. It's like literally cables. I've seen it. It looks really bizarre. So I write reports that my boss translates into the cables and sends them and then they'll send something back and then he'll translate it and tell me what I need to do. If she believes it's spying on activists to suppress a free speech movement, then, you know, peace be to her. And um, I hope she feels good sleeping at night being on that side of things. We're a group of student activists advocating for Palestinian human rights. And to think that we, we're, we're so upsetting and threatening to a state is pretty awe striking to me. Um, Creepy, but also, I guess, makes me more proud of the work I did. It's nice uh, kind of seeing what they're talking about. What do they say? They don't talk about like our side at all, which is disappointing, so it'd be like, nice to do the drama. But um, it's mainly them sharing their like, videos, their like, AJ Plus videos on yeah. Al Jazeera. What do you think about Al Jazeera? It sucks because they have a lot of interesting like liberal videos, which I'm like, wow, like that's amazing to hear about that human rights issue and about that like sexism situation yeah. or whatever. And then they'll show like why Israel is an apartheid state. And they're like, ooh, like, not anymore. So that's what's annoying is that it gets you know tied to all those causes. That's hard to be liberal. You represent that government. Yeah, I can't say anything negative about BB or like the government because I don't really work for them. Not directly. But I'm just a normal American. In episode two, Tony discovers how the lobby raises funds for congressmen. Basically, they hand him an envelope with 20 credit card numbers. For all the like, legal reasons, it's just people pool their money. Handing over a quarter million dollars. That buys a lawmaker. And how a row over anti-Semitism swept through the University of Tennessee. You have to show that they're racist hate groups and to consistently portray them that way. 